Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. My, uh, my name is Joel St. John, and this is my colleague, uh, Nicholas Giegel. And uh, we're security consultants with a company called ISEC Partners, based out of, based out of the, uh, the United States in their Seattle office. And we're here today to talk all about cheating in online games. So a bit of an agenda. Uh, we're going to go into some of the, the history of uh, cheating in games and how it's developed over the years. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the current state of uh, the arms race between cheaters and the, the anti-cheat software that's uh, designed to prevent it. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about where we see the, uh, the future of cheating going. Uh, from there, we're actually going to talk about some uh, vulnerabilities that we've found in uh, anti-cheat software. Uh, and then finally, we're going to talk about some potential solutions to these problems and how to uh, maybe prevent them going forward. Uh, all right. But first, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, money. So uh, as the gaming industry has, has developed, it's turned into a, a multi-billion dollar industry uh, over the past few decades. Uh, developers in this space make uh, money in, in several different ways. Uh, one of the most popular being uh, the monthly subscription model that you see in some of the, the massively multiplayer online games. Um, in addition to this, we actually have professional gamers uh, that are making a considerable amount of money now uh, through international tournaments, through uh, streaming on sites like YouTube and Twitch. Uh, and it, th that's generally through, through advertisement and uh, corporate sponsorship. Uh, finally, in, in some of these games, we've actually seen a rise of, uh, of a kind of a gray market where virtual items, currency, account, anything uh, can be sold for, for real world money. Um, this has actually become a, a pretty profitable space in some of the more popular games. Uh, all right. so. That's really uh, you know, one of the big reasons why some of this stuff actually matters. Uh, but let's take a look at how, uh, how cheating has, is going to affect it. So first, uh, just to sort of get some common ground, uh, what do we define a as cheating? So uh, we generally think of this as you know, somehow gaining an unfair advantage against the other players in the game. Uh, and this can take a few, a few different forms. Uh, the first one here, uh, so ab abusing uh, game logic in, in one way or another. Uh, for instance, you could use uh, multiple accounts to play the game at the same time and get an advantage that way. Uh, you can actually uh, create bots or scripts that will automate some of the more uh, repetitive parts in a game. Uh, or you can actually take advantage of some of the extra client-side data that is, that is present in some uh, different genres, such as first-person shooters. Uh, it's also possible to, uh, to find bugs or glitches in, in the system uh, to actually let you, you know, exploit the client, server, or maybe other players. Uh, but for the purposes of this talk, we're really focusing on, on the first category here, uh, so, so the abusing of, uh, of game logic. Uh, all right, uh, so a bit of a brief history of, of cheating. Uh, in, in early single-player computer games, uh, cheating is you know, as simple as, as actually patching the, the code or the source uh, or the application. Uh, and it's actually pretty similar with modern games because, I mean, at the end of the day, who really cares if you cheat in a single-player game, right? Uh, a lot of de developers have actually uh, created cheat codes in, in their games that basically allows a player to, to go ahead and cheat you know, at their own discretion. Uh, as, as multiplayer games began to emerge, however, uh, cheating really became a large issue. Uh, but as, as time has gone on, uh, they've actually learned to, to cope to the point where uh, while cheaters still exist, they're, they're at least uh, not as rampant as they were uh, you know, about a decade or two ago. Uh, as we were talking about the, the money aspect of things, you know, this cheating can actually have real consequences in these games uh, due, to, yeah, due to the large amount of money involved. Uh, a successful cheat can actually be sold to different players, uh, and it can also uh, impact the, the gamers that are making a, mon uh, a living off of uh, you know, playing the game at the professional level. Um, all right, so, so why don't we talk a little bit about some, some real world examples. Uh, so one of the most common or popular ways to, to cheat in different games are uh, what we consider speed or movement hacks. And so these are uh, sort of broadly defined as moving outside how the game uh, intends you to. So this could be moving faster than normal, uh, it could be teleporting around, maybe flying through the sky. Uh, it can take a lot of different forms in different genres of games. Uh, in, in other games, we see uh, what we, I guess, broadly call scripting here, that uh, you can use to, uh, I guess, script specific actions in the game so that you can actually play it at a higher skill level than you might uh, normally be able to. So, so co combining several actions at once so that you have to play, press one key, for instance. Uh, also, we actually, from, from the beginning, we've seen a big problem with botting. So in a lot of these games, you uh, can actually 
uh, collect uh, resources or currency through some, some really repetitive uh, ways, and bots allow you to automate that process. You can leave them running for hours at a time, and they will just accumulate that for you. Uh, oh, man, that's kind of dark, but uh, some of you might recognize that game. So, so a botter might, uh, for instance, uh, travel around a map and go to these different ore spawns to, uh, to gather ore. They'll just do that for hours on end, uh, collect as much as they can, then they'll go and they'll sell that for the in-game currency, and then that in turn can actually uh, be sold through those uh, virtual gray markets and turned into real world money. Uh, so definitely you know, a big issue, uh, undermines the, the players that actually want to play the game. Uh, from there, we also have uh, player or item finding hacks that uh, are, I think, most common in some first person shooters. So uh, the next one we have here is a, uh, a survival horror game, and this one, uh, if you, if you die in this game, it's permanent death. Uh, items are very hard to come by. You're constantly trying to stay alive. Uh, and this, this hack actually will uh, find all of the items that uh, have been uh, sent to your client. So your client has the data on where these are, and this just highlights them so you know exactly where they are. It's not pictured in, in, in here, but it actually works for, for other players as well. And so uh, you can use that to, to sneak up on other people and you know, kill them and take their stuff. Uh, in, in addition to this, we also have some things uh, like wall hacks or x-ray mods. Uh, and these uh, let you, in some, uh, I guess, see through terrain in, in general. That's a, a way to, to describe it. So it's, it's kind of similar to the one we were just talking about. Uh, but here for an example, uh, if some of you are familiar with, uh, with Minecraft, uh, this is what the game typically looks like. So we've got a player in a cave here. There's, there's stone, there's ore, you know, all that great and good. Uh, but once you install one of these x-ray hacks, uh, we've got a player here on the surface, and they've just wiped away everything that's not interesting to them. So in this case, you know, maybe they want to know where all the ore is. Uh, it, in some different modes, you know, maybe they're trying to find chests that belong to other players to raid their bases or something like that. So uh, all of this information is being sent to the client, and so we can you know, leverage it as, at our discretion, right? All right. Uh, over the years, uh, to help combat against the people cheating in these games, we've actually seen the rise of a lot of different anti-cheat suites. So uh, one of the, the more popular ones with the, the Blizzard series of games, uh, I think it started with World of Warcraft, but it's, it's I think, in most of their games now. Uh, it's called The Warden, uh, developed in 2004. Uh, in, the, in several of the, the Valve series of games, we have uh, the Valve Anti-Cheat, or VAC, and that's in, used in, uh, for instance, the Counter-Strike series, uh, Team Fortress 2, uh, among others. Uh, we'd actually see some completely third-party uh, anti-cheat engines. So, uh, for instance, BattleEye is one of the ones that uh, can be integrated with whatever game you want, but I think it's most uh, commonly known for uh, the, the Arma series and uh, the DayZ mod for that and the, the standalone now. And these all have some, some similar uh, qualities. So, for one, they, they all tend to, to run in user land. So there's not a, a kernel uh, component in there, though some of the anti-cheats do, uh, do leverage uh, things in kernel space. They tend to be very reactive. So uh, they'll find out about a cheat, they'll uh, you know, figure out how to detect it, and then they'll push that detect detection mechanism out to their clients. Clients get detected, they get banned. Uh, they're also all really only you know, meant to be a mitigation. They, they want to stop as many cheaters as possible, but comprehensively stopping them is, is not really uh, something that they consider you know, possible in, in this model. All right, uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about where the, the current uh, state of cheating in games is, and I'm actually going to pass it over to, to Nico here to talk yeah. about it a little bit. Can you, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, cool. So uh, now that Joel has shown you what the, uh, the cheats currently look like, we're going to take a look at how they're actually implemented, and uh, then we'll look into how anti-cheats catch them, and then we will take it just one step further and look at how we can you know, prevent the anti-cheats from figuring out that somebody's cheating. So um, the cheats usually, uh, you know, they fall into one of three categories. Uh, you have the internal cheats, the external cheats, and the uh, network ones. So uh, the most common one is probably the, uh, the one leveraging DLL injection. So I'm sure you guys are familiar with DLL injection on Windows. It's the usual, you know, uh, map some memory, create remote thread, load the DLL, and everything. So these cheats come in two parts. You have a loader, and the cheat itself, the cheat logic, is implemented in the DLL. So, uh, you know, the loader loads the cheat DLL into the game. And then, of course, you know, the cheat logic then has full access for read and write to the entire, you know, game address space. So pretty much anything goes. Um, 
in order to display uh, usually like a little menu. Uh, a lot of these you know, uh, cheats actually have menus so you can select what you want to do. Um, uh, you, they hook uh, direct, direct 3D calls and um, uh, that's pretty much it really. Um, so uh, another thing is the network packet manipulation. So these ones um, actually are a little less common. Um, one thing that they do, for instance, they can introduce artificial lag. So if you're playing an FPS, you know, things are just, you know, really quick. Um, so uh, if uh, the cheat uh, delays or, you know, blocks or just drops the packets that sends your position from the client that the client is legitimately trying to send to the server, then all of a sudden to your opponents, your character looks like it's teleporting if it's displaying at all. Um, uh, repeat packets, so you grab a packet, let's say, uh, you know, depending on the integrity level, uh, the integrity checking that's done at the server level, you know, these might or might, be, might, or might not be possible. Uh, but uh, let's say that there is, um, um, I don't know, a damage packet. You're sending, you know, 10 damage to whatever player. While well, you repeat that packet, you get, you know, a lot of damage. Uh, or directly modify the packets directly and change whatever you can. Um, finally, there's external cheating. Um, it is believed that external cheats... Uh, have been developed in an attempt to hide from early uh, anti-cheats, uh, because, well, as the name suggests, uh, they're not uh, doing, they're not, you know, uh, in process. They're not in the game process. It's actually a separate process, um, and so they access the game memory by using uh, read process memory, write process memory, which is you know, ends up, you know, generating a system called Windows, uh, which is actually terrible for performance. But uh, it's, we're assuming that at some point it was able to uh, go unnoticed by uh, you know, the anti-cheats at the time. Uh, now not so much as we'll see in the next slide. Um, and in order to, uh, to render things to the, to the player, um, they usually create a transparent window on top of the game window so that you can see, uh, remember the little ESP like extrasensory or extrasensorial perception? You know, remember the, uh, the, the, the shooter that we were showing, showing you guys? So, you know, they do that via a transparent window instead of directly hooking the, 3D the direct 3D calls as in the uh, uh, internal cheats. Um, so that's, that's pretty much it for the, uh, the cheating in games. Uh, the, the current state of the cheats is generally like they they generally fall in one of these three categories. Um, so anti cheats, well, what do they do? So uh, well, they, they kind of follow an antivirus uh, uh, model, and sometimes uh, they they have components that are loaded directly into the game process. Often they have a service running a system, uh, but essentially what they will do is um, scan game process uh, and uh, you know uh, the game process uh, first and foremost in order to find. Uh, you know, known signatures for uh, cheats, again, just like an antivirus would. Um, and then they have some game-specific che checks. For instance, when you have uh, games, uh, a lot of games uh, have like a, like a little scripting engine within, so they can scan for, you know, cheats that are related to that. Um, hook detection. So now this gets a little bit interesting um, because the current um, arm race between cheats and anti-cheat is, remember, like the internal cheats, the most common ones, they hook DirectX calls, right? So... Um, so let's say that usually the, the way that the pointer chain looks like is that you have you know, a C++ object and you have a member that is also a C++ object and so on and so forth with V tables all over the place. So the way they hook it is they replace one of the V tables and to point to a V table that will call their stuff. So you hook at a certain level and then, uh, and then the anti-cheat comes in and expects you know, this, this, this uh, V table, this pointer to be modified and then they detect it. So then what do the cheats you know, do? Well, they say, okay, let's hook a little bit earlier, let's hook a little bit later. So that's kind of like the arm race going on. Um, so what the anti-cheats do now is they actually pick up you know, kind of a sort of a, as early as possible in the, in the game code and then they just you know, parse the whole pointer chain to try to find uh, a modification. Uh, it, it's similar to uh, the Windows mitigation known as SE hop uh, for uh, uh, structured exception handling, if you guys are familiar with that. Um, then also another one that's interesting is the call stacks uh, periodic checks. So what this does is, um, so the, uh, the anti-cheat, uh, well, the anti-cheat will wait for uh, one of the uh, game threads to be uh, either sleeping or otherwise you know, non-active, uh, maybe got preempted and whatnot, but it will basically go through the stack and try to find a malicious stack, well, a, a cheat stack, a known cheat stack. So that's also something that's you know, pretty advanced uh, compared to just you know, blunt uh, signature checking. Um, so that's pretty nice. Then there's like debug related detections, right? Some cheats have been known to kind of uh, hide their marks by uh, uh, leveraging, you know, XCC, uh, you know, interrupt three, like debug, debug mechanisms and things like that. Um, so uh, so the, actually these, these debug uh, related detections are, you know, their purpose is twofold. One is to prevent this kind of things and two is to hinder the development of cheats. Uh, because if you have the game process running and, you know, you put your breakpoint, it doesn't get hit, you know, it's annoying. 
Um, so that's that's something. Um, and then out of process, well, uh, well, actually, it's like all the processes. So in order to detect uh, external cheats, uh, then they uh, they scan, you know, but all the processes and try to find interesting things. Uh, same thing, signature detection. Uh, some will go as far as actually checking. Uh, memory sections that are not mapped as DLLs, um, you know, because that's how they hide. Um, uh, all the things they might be scanning for in other processes is handles, right? Remember the external sheet. Uh, they're calling read process memory, write process memory all the time uh, to update, you know, whatever data structure they're interested in and everything. So um, for that, you need a handle to the process. So that's something they scan for. Uh, uh, that's uh, that's it. Oh, and a couple of things that we'll, we're listing here. This is not an exhaustive list. I mean, there's just a lot of things, but this is this covers you know most most of it. Um, things that have been uh, kind of controversial due to privacy issues. Um, some anti cheats will actually scan files on your disk, and um, you know then they will send it uh, to their servers for further analysis. Uh, most of it's probably um, automated, but I'm sure at some point it probably becomes manual. Anyway, uh, that's kind of creepy. Um, then um, check DNS history for cheat updates. Oh yeah, so because there's like a constant arm race between the cheats and the anti-cheats, um, well, anti-cheat sellers, I'm sorry, <laughs> cheat sellers, you know, cheat and people who just, you know, uh, make and sell cheats, uh, constantly have to update their uh, software. And they do that uh, by using, you know, update servers. Because one of the cheats gets detected, then they go and, you know, make a, a new one. Uh, so for that, uh, you know, the anti-cheats, uh, you know, have picked up on that, and so they're saying, okay, let's check out the D let's check the DNS history to see the requests have been made, and oh, this is a known cheat server, ban that player, or cheat update server, let's ban that player. Um, so that's it for the uh, for the anti-cheats. So as you've noticed, um, most of these techniques, if not all, all these techniques, actually uh, kind of start with uh, the idea that the anti-cheat has the ability to open up any process, see what's in there, uh, open up files, and everything. Which uh, actually uh, is an, an assumption that just could not, should not be made uh, when you're a user mode component and the, and, and the, uh, the, uh, the user actually has uh, control over his machine. So um, what we're proposing is uh, something that will be a lot harder to pick up for anti-cheats, which is a rootkit-like functionality to hide a cheat activity. So how does this work? Well, um, two parts, a kernel driver and a user mode executable. Uh, writing a cheat completely in kernel, that's possible. Uh, it's just, well, if not annoying, it, it's probably, uh, you know, uh, well, yeah, it's just be that, it'd be annoying. I mean, it's doable, uh, but so uh, there's no need for that. Um, so basically, the, uh, the interesting, the, 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 the actual cheat logic will be implemented in user mode, just like a regular cheat, and the driver will do a few things and will provide a few services to the user mode uh, portion of the cheat to, um, to, to hide it completely from the, uh, uh, the, the techniques we mentioned before. So the kernel driver, what does it do? So the first thing it'll do is that it will make uh, the user mode portion a protected process. Now, protected processes are this uh, feature in Windows that was introduced in Vista, I believe, uh, in order to uh, help DRM enforcement. Uh, I mean, there are other ways that you could hide a process. I mean, you know, rootkits, you know, have been doing that for decades, right? You could remove, uh, you know, NT keeps a list of all the processes. You could just remove it from the double link list. You could have callbacks that are used by antiviruses. But we figured, you know, this only takes flipping one bit on the e-process block. So that sounded simple enough, so we went that way. Um, so uh, flip the bit, and uh, all of a sudden the process is protected. So uh, even if you have an anti-cheat running a system and it tries to open up the process, it gets access denied. Um, so now the interesting part of the driver, what it will do is that uh, the user mode executable will actually be, right, it, it's not a DLL, it's actually an executable. So it'll be all run as a separate process. So in order to access the game memory in a covert way, um, so the driver will provide this uh, mapping mechanism. Well, it will actually, uh, you know, get a request from the user mode portion of the cheat, and it will map uh, directly page frames off, I mean, it will, map, it will map memory from the game process into the cheat process. The driver will do that. Um, and so uh, an another thing that would do is that actually we haven't actually merged that in, uh, but uh, essentially to prevent the, uh, you know, having a uh, file, uh, basically the anti-cheat, you know, pick up files from your hard drive and, this, you could, and, and send it to a server, you could uh, just install that filter driver that we have that will put um, a filter device on the file system stack and return file not found when uh, it's getting a request. We actually haven't had a need to implement that, uh, but it's, it's uh, that's uh, work, uh, the work, I guess. 
Um, so the user mode executable, like I said before, implements the cheat logic. And uh, it keeps track of the game cheat mappings, right? Uh, this is actually not completely necessary, but it's just a performance improvement because uh, once the uh, memory is mapped into the cheat process, you don't want to have to, there's no need to call the driver again to say remap this memory, remap this memory, right? Because every time it's a system call. So for performance, uh, you just keep track of it. You can just implement that logic in user mode as we have. So um, here's the way it looks. So this is how you're, uh, so this is how, you know, when your CPU is executing the game, uh, and basically this memory, uh, OX42000, I'm not sure you guys can read. Um, so this is like game data that let's say the cheat is interested in, right? So when the CPU is running, uh, the page tables, are they're abstracted. This is not what page tables look like, but uh, this basically shows that they provide the translation between virtual memory and physical memory. So you see that when the game is uh, trying to access this virtual memory up there, then uh, the MMU will do the translation based on the page tables before uh, the, uh, the read or write request is sent on the bus. And uh, it will actually map to, let's say, uh, page frame FDF, right? So what will happen once the cheat uh, calls into the driver is this. So the cheat virtual memory will be mapping to the exact same uh, physical memory. So this is completely transparent. Uh, it will be very fast because the hardware does the work. So basically, it's accessing uh, game memory as if it were um, as if it were its own. So it's very fast and uh, uh, pretty covered. So uh, how is this done? So we'll show you guys the uh, brief code snippet. I'm not going to bore you with that too much. But the idea is that um, these APIs are documented and they're public. So there's nothing there's nothing like too crazy here. Uh, the first thing, the first thing that you'll notice, the first line, PS lookup, process by process ID. So uh, this will basically find uh, the the game process. Uh, the second thing is allocate MDL. So an MDL, if you guys are not familiar with this, is this partially opaque uh, structure. Uh, you can find the full description on MSDN. And what it does is, is it basically is a um, think of it as a list of page frames. It's a, it describes uh, like a range of physical memory. That's essentially what it is. So now the interesting system calls, I mean, not system calls, we're in kernel here. This is what running in the driver. Uh, the interesting calls here are KE stack attach process because the, what this will do is will actually grab your thread. So we're talking about the driver thread, you know, that's handling the out call sent from the, from the, uh, from the cheat client. Um, and it will jump this thread into the address space of the, uh, of the, of the game. And so once, uh, once uh, this has suc succeeded, then the MM uh, for memory management initialize MDL will uh, take as parameter, you know, see the base address, the second parameter is the actually the virtual address in the game that we're interested in. And it will, it will basically fill the MDL with the page frames that are actually mapped there. So remember the, uh, the FDF, that that's identifies this. Then when you call KE and stack detach process, then you come back into the cheat process and then you call um, MM map lock page specify cache, which will map, and then you get uh, basically that. Um, so, uh, and then basically unlock the pages, uh, free some memory, and do some reference counting so the driver doesn't, you know, blue screen on you, and you're good to go. Uh, that's now your memory. So, we have a little demo, uh, really briefly, uh, to demonstrate this, and hopefully it works. So, we're going to, uh, we're going to map memory of this awesome game called Notepad. Notepad. Um, so this is Notepad right here. I can't, where's my mouse? Okay. So this is Notepad right here. And um, eh. all right. <coughs> so you see here, so um, I can't really see. Can you guys tell me when I hit notepad.demo? Yeah, Is that it? That's it. OK, thank you. Is that handles? I can't see. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So as you can see, there's, there's no handle. I mean, there's no handle to, uh, to the notepad process. And then when you type here, hello, oh. then it shows up down there without anything. Like, so basically, the memory is dual mapped, and you can see it in here. And just to show that, you can also write to it. Um, what was it again? Let me see your. Uh, tell me if there's a typo, huh? I, I think the L needs to be capitalized. Oh, yes, it does. Whoops. 
Okay, so you can also write to the memory and you know from under the game's feet and it won't notice a difference. I'll just overwrite it completely. So, um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so that's the, oh yeah, hang on, I gotta get out of the VM. Uh, okay, so that's done. So pros and cons. So the strength of this method is that it's completely generic, right? You can do it to any game because it provides, you know, uh, unlimited access to the game in a complete covered way, to the game memory, read, write, it's fast. So you can apply it to just anything, uh, any type of game, it, it will not matter. This is not specific. Um, it's virtually undetectable from user mode. Um, as you guys can imagine, you just you know have a process stuck into a driver. This process is protected. The file you cannot access. It's not going to happen. I mean, anti-cheats are going to have a hard time. Um, so one thing about this method that is you know interesting is that there is actually a bunch of uh, publicly available uh, cheat sources online. The problem with these public sources is that obviously they're public, so anti-cheats know of them and they can detect them. So um, with this, what you can do is simply grab a public source modify the calls to, let's say, an external cheat, modify the source to, to change uh, from using read process memory, write process memory, you change them by calling the driver or calling whatever uh, memory, little memory management you have going in user mode, and that's it. You get an undetectable cheat. Um, so that's pretty nice. And as I mentioned before, it's got pretty good performance because simply there's, there's nothing. I mean, there's no, there's no system call. There's, there's nothing to do. It's your memory. Have fun. Um, so weaknesses, well, um, it's in kernel mode, so it is as strong or as weak as anything else running in kernel mode. Um, so if you have a cheat, an anti-cheat that makes its way to, to kernel, then um, you have a problem. Um, now, as we've seen with antiviruses, uh, until the machine got locked down with um, various mechanisms, uh, kernel mode battles usually end up with the winner being whoever loads first. So. But at least you know, at least they have a shot at it. Um, another thing that would be a, a, a minor inconvenience would be that, of course, you have to run in debug mode, or you have to get your driver signed, which is actually not a big deal. But um, it's not as easy as just you know, just running some executable. Um, okay. So um, so this is it for the uh, the cheating framework. Um, now uh, we are going to take it just uh, one step, be you know, beyond that, and we're going to—I mean, we're going to show you guys that we uh, actually attacked the anti-cheat software itself. Um, so anti-cheat libraries are actually very interesting because uh, they provide an, uh, an, ad an additional attack surface. The, the interesting thing about this attack surface is that it's going to be running on the client, it's going to be running on the server, and it's going to be running across multiple games. So if I were an exploit developer, business-wise, this looks like a good target because if you if you pop a vuln in a in a game, then you can just attack that game. If you have a vulnerability in a, an anti-cheat software, you can use it across a bunch of games. So you just have you know, immediately a broader audience. Um, so what happens when there's a problem? Well, let's take a look at BattleEye. So BattleEye is, um, as we discussed before, an anti-cheat. So the, the way it works is that you have a, battle, uh, a global server uh, that is used to keep track of bands and things like that, and then you have and then you have uh, you know, a, a server DLL that's running in the game server, and then you have a client DLL that's running in the game client. So far, it's expected, right? Uh, now, one thing interesting about it is that it actually hooks, uh, the, way, the way that they communicate is they piggyback on the already established uh, communication between the game client and the game server, uh, which is usually UDP. Uh, and so they hook a receive or receive from you know, type of call, and then they basically parse the packets to figure out whether they're intended for the game itself or they're intended for the battle eye uh, logic. Um, so uh, the way they uh, differentiate the packets is, uh, is based off the packet structure, right? So the first, uh, the first two bytes are just B and E as a signature, and then you have like a hash, and then a length that is also occasionally used as a code, and then uh, that's that's it for the metadata, and the rest is basically data for uh, the the server to process, the battle -like server to process. So um, here's the first thing that we noticed. Uh, also, just one thing I'd like to specify: we did not do like a full pen test on this. It's just that as we were researching, you know, cheats and anti-cheats, we just we just happened to like look a little bit into how this works, and we just noticed these. So this is not extensive. We didn't do fudging. We didn't do anything like that. It's, these are just a couple of bugs that just happened. Um, so uh, this this part is uh, actually the uh, it's the 
uh, part of the packet parsing. So the, you see, if you see in the first in the first box, uh, the call to uh, sub one zero zero one five four thirty is actually the hash check. So we actually had to reverse the hash function to get this code to accept our packet. Um, but if since we got it right, then it makes it down to uh, the box to the left, and then to the other box to the left. And then you'll see that ESI contains the head of the packet. It contains the start of the packet. And then you end up in the last box to the left, all the way down here. Um, I think it might be cut a little bit, but hopefully you guys can see it. And if you can see it, then you'll notice that there is a move S6 instruction. Uh, the problem with this is that, uh, well, there's an error in the code where this is uh, this character is a signed value. And uh, when, uh, when they do the comparison, they basically do a move SX, which will sign extend it all the way into the 32-bit register ESI. So the magic value here is FC, which the last bit is the signed bit is set. But then you end up with FFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFFF
Uh, it's sort of two part. Uh, in the first box, we've got the, the disassembly here for, uh, for the login. And the first thing they do is actually check the length of the provided password uh, against the, the, the length of the actual password. And if it, uh, if it doesn't match up, it just immediately uh, bails out. And so as you can imagine, that's a, a pretty differing uh, sort of you know, function. And so uh, we feed enough requests to that with different lengths, and then we can eventually uh, figure out the, the length for the password. Uh, from that point, uh, once, we, once we actually have the length, we get into uh, a string comparison against the password. Uh, as you can see down here, uh, what eventually happens is we get a, a call to, to string copy, uh, and that's actually not a, uh, a constant time operation. So uh, we end up passing something like half a million uh, attempts for each character that's, that's possible in the password, uh, and there's definitely a noticeable uh, difference in the timing. Um, and for this one, we actually have a, a demo as well, uh, though it's, it's just a video. Uh, where is, there it is. And I think it might be a little hard to see, so I'm, I'm sorry about that, but. All right, so what we've got going here is up in the, the left, we actually have the, the configuration file for the remote console login. Uh, we're using password safe to generate just a, a random 24 character password. Uh, and then we save it in the, the configuration file here. And then once we're done with that, uh, we actually just launch the, uh, the, the server using that password. Um, that'll take just a moment. And this is actually against uh, Arma 2, but it, it, it would really apply to any of the, the BattleEye enabled uh, games. So once that's going, it's, it's been enabled using that password. Uh, and then we uh, start our, our attack here, which is uh, just a, a Python script. And so we've, uh, we've sped this up quite a bit. Uh, I think about, oh, I don't know, 1,500% or something so that we can uh, actually present it here in good time. But uh, it's, it's a little bit hard to see. But it's just going through uh, each character. It's, it's uh, again, like a half a million iterations for the, any, any character that can be used in a password. Uh, and we don't have the numbers up here, but there's, there's a, a gap between the correct character uh, and any of the other characters. And so you can see it's just slowly wake, working its way through. Uh, I wish I could zoom that in, but uh, yeah, I don't know. So we're at about 14. It'll, it'll take uh, a few, uh, few minutes here, but. Uh, How long did it take total? It, it, so the, the attack uh, from, from beginning to completion, it takes all of uh, 17 minutes. So uh, this, is, this is locally, uh, but it could be pretty easily modified to work over the network. Uh, it was just this was for, for just a proof of concept, the easiest way to do it. Uh, once you start doing it over the network, it's going to take significantly more uh, attempts. And so uh, it would take a little bit longer, but it's definitely still possible. All right, so we've actually slowed down here. We've, we've guessed 23 of the characters. Uh, and the actual uh, BattleEye server up there, uh, you see a new line. So once it found the right password, uh, you can see the admin logged into the console. and. Now we've got the password. Yeah, like I said, it took all of 17 minutes. So um, you can start kicking people on back. Yeah, one, once you're into, uh, into the, in the console, yeah, you can, you can kick people from the server. You can do all sorts of, of fun things from in, from in there. But yeah, that's, that's all for that one. So for, for both of these bugs, uh, we, we found them in uh, August of this year and, and reported them to the vendor uh, in, the, in the same month. Uh, the, the first of the bugs has actually been, been fixed and uh, patches have been released, and which, is, which is great. Uh, and they're still working on, on patching the, the, the timing attack, but they definitely have that coming out soon, uh, hopefully. So, <laughs> all right, so uh, what, do we, what do we think to be the, you know, the future of, of anti-cheat? So uh, one option here is actually to, to move that, that arms race that we're talking about into, into kernel space. Uh, the problem is, is, is it's going to be uh, incredibly tricky. Uh, and it's, it's most definitely, again, not a, not a comprehensive solution. And once you're working in that space, uh, any problems there can, you know, instead of getting an application bug, you end up, you know, with a with blue screen of death. So uh, might be worth it. Uh, a second way uh, is actually to get more of a human factor. So, so players policing other players, uh, giving them the, the option to actually report players in, other, in, in their games. Uh, and we're seeing more and more of that as uh, newer games are released. Uh, and it's, it's, it's great because it gives the, the, the players sort of a, a means of self-regulation. Uh, and it turns out that, that you know, people tend to be much better at catching cheaters than, than some of the automated processes. Um, 
As far as, uh, as full solution goes, there, there are a couple different uh, ways that the, I guess, the model in some of these genres can be changed to uh, help prevent against these sort of attacks. Uh, one of these is actually the, the full streaming of games. Uh, not quite, quite there yet, but what we could do is we could have all of the, the game logic and everything going on on a server, so on a trusted server that we have, and then basically feed a, a video stream to, to our player. Uh, the, the problem with, it, with this is that it would take an incredible amount of, of bandwidth, and uh, we're just really not, not there yet. Uh, one other way is actually to, to move the, the platform uh, to some sort of closed solution. So you can think of uh, maybe something a little more like a, like a gaming console, where uh, the underlying hardware I don't necessarily control unless you know, I open up that, that box and find some, some interesting uh, bugs in there. But uh, the problem with, with the open platform is that you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's my hardware and you know, I can, I can do, with it, with, with, do with it what I will. Um, but yeah, just potential solutions, not sure if, uh, you know, where all of that, that's going. But. So uh, I, I guess uh, to, to conclude, uh, you know, at the end, w what does this all mean? So uh, we've, we've sort of established that you know, anti-cheat is, is definitely a mitigation at, at best. It's not gonna stop all of the cheaters. It was never really intended to. Uh, we, we've established that, that anti-cheat actually creates additional attack surface, not just for you know, the, the game server, but actually for the people playing the game. Um, in addition to this, the, since the anti-cheat tends to run with escalated privileges, you know, uh, some, something running a, a system, a, a service, uh, if you do find an exploit in there, uh, the impact can be you know, pretty severe uh, to, the, to, the, to the players in particular, or I guess you know, to the server. Right, um, also, what, what one thing that crossed our, you know, our mind, obviously, is once you pop the server, then you can turn around and attack the clients. Uh, it'll take more bugs, but you can get a pretty instant botnet that way. So. Yeah. Um, we've also talked about you know, how the, the current anti-cheat, it's, it's actually possible to bypass it completely by, by taking it all to, to kernel space. It, it doesn't take that much code. It's all out there. And it's, it's really just a matter of time before people start doing it. Um, Finally, we, we think some you know, real fundamental changes need to happen to the system because uh, as we talked about before, money is becoming more and more of a, a part of these online games. And as that incentive you know, increases, we're gonna get not only you know, more cheaters, but definitely more sophisticated cheaters when uh, they can move into this space and, and make you know, quite a bit of money. Uh, all right, uh, so that's, that's about it. Uh, Wanted to, to say thank you to uh, a couple of people from, from our office, uh, Rachel and, and Jason, for, for helping us you know, uh, through all of this. And then uh, the, the two interns we have pictured here, definitely wanted to get them in. They, they actually helped us write the timing attack. And uh, you know, interns are, are people too, uh, despite what some people say. Uh, and then yeah, just, just too many uh, coworkers to list back in our Seattle office that have you know, helped, uh, helped us build this talk into to, to what it is today. But, um, yeah, that's that, that's it. Uh, any any questions for us about how any of any of this works? Uh, yeah, you talked. Uh, I saw that you reversed the uh, battle line. Uh -huh. So you have the source code of the server? Uh, no, it's no. closed source. No, it's closed source. Oh no, it's public. Oh, I know what you're asking. It's public. You go to their website, you can download yeah. the server and the client. It comes as a little DLL. Uh, it's actually pretty convenient. You know, you have a game server, you just put the DLL on there and it's, that's there. So we figured oh. we'd take a look. So at, at, at that point, like, like we were talking before, it becomes a game uh, sort of similar to the, the antivirus space where it, you know, it's who loaded first. And when you're a cheater, uh, you, can, you can basically always ensure that your kernel driver loads first. And so uh, it's definitely trickier uh, to do something like that. But Th Think of it as the antivirus race, except the user is on the virus side. Yeah, that's Good sort luck. of what it boils down to. In the back there? Yeah, you can do that. Problem there is graphics. Yeah, performance really. But once once you know this gets solved, yeah, it'll open up like a whole new area, uh, exactly like rootkits and viruses before. It follows really the same pattern. But yes, that's that would definitely do the trick if you get if you can run your game more than ten frames per second. Yes. Uh, 
Uh, so, I, I mean, in terms of, of anti-cheat, most of the ones that we've actually looked at aren't uh, really in the kernel space at, at all. We didn't have uh, a chance to, I guess, comprehensively look at all of them. Uh, but I guess, again, getting back to you know the fact that uh, at the end of the day, even if they're in wor working in, in kernel space, you know, with an, with enough work, we could still bypass them. So, uh, as far sorry, what was the other the other half to your question? Okay, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes? When you put your code into the kernel... I'm sorry? You code it in the kernel. Correct. What stops my anti-cheat thing to saying no pastramo.exe, I don't like that, you're cheating? Uh, so we can hide it entirely. It, it, as far as the anti-cheat goes, it doesn't exist in the first place if you're operating in the kernel. Or you, you can hide it. Does that make sense? Okay, well, the the, the, way, the way we did it originally and, and, uh, is, is to uh, make the process uh, protected. Uh, you know, with a DRM feature of, win of modern Windows, uh, we basically flip a bit on, on, the, on, the, um, on the data structure that represents the process in, in Windows kernel and NT, and, and then that process is not protected and you just can't open it even if your system on the machine. But that, that's just one method. I mean, it, it's been done many times with uh, either uh, removing the process completely from the doubly linked list, or I mean, think of uh, think of the uh, anti cheat really as being the virus, and uh, the driver as being the antivirus. You know that has kind of control over it. You can just completely blind it. You can contain it. You can do anything you want. It's two different privilege, privilege levels. So, any other any other questions? All right. Well, Great. thanks everyone for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.